At the INET conference, uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which was in Berlin last weekend, uh, one of the speakers there said there's a, um, they, they were introducing Adair Turner, who's the chairman of the FSA, and he was saying, you know, Adair Turner is not afraid to use taboo terms. What a lot of economists talk about is banks doing intermediation, which is this idea of taking money from savers and lending it to businesses that need to invest and grow, which is a bit of a fairy tale, really. Um, and he says, you know, Adair, Adair's willing to use the taboo term credit creation, which is about banks creating credit when they make loans, um, which is a slightly different, well, it's quite a different understanding of the system. But I actually think credit creation, the term itself, is kind of masking what's really going on. Um, so I'm going to use a really taboo term, which is money creation. And the reason for that is what banks create is not credit anymore. You might hear some economists saying, well, banks don't create money, they just create credit. But if it's credit, there would be some sort of risk there. But then the government comes in and says, we're going to guarantee all of that credit. So if your bank fails, we'll give you taxpayers' money back. And the way, what that does is that makes this, this credit created by the banks as good as cash, every bit as safe, and it takes all that sort of risk out of the bank credit. And then when there's no risk with bank credit, it's not credit anymore, it's money. It's guaranteed by the state, and therefore it is money. And we use it for over 99% of all the transactions that we make by value. Um, so this, you know, what we're using is essentially privatized money, which is created by banks. So, um, so let's, let's look at some of the consequences of this. Firstly, housing, probably the one that affects most people in the most significant way. How many people here have heard this story, um, this conversation down the pub? Somebody says, why are house prices so high? And then somebody shoots back, well, there's too many immigrants in it. <laughs> because obviously immigrants have so much money when they're moving into this country to find a new job, working in Starbucks or whatever, they're also bringing a quarter of a million to buy a house. So that's part of the problem. And also there's not enough houses. Uh, we've not been building enough. There's too much restrictions on, uh, on planning. This sort of story, and it's one that many economists use mainly because they don't understand that banks create money. Because they don't understand that banks create money, the only explanation they've got for high house prices is supply and demand. So they assume there's too many people wanting houses and not enough houses. And this same explanation is used by politicians, and it's, it's basically the debate we have at the moment about housing. Um, but I want to show you this, um, if we actually put some data to this. Now this purple line here is house prices from 1991. Uh, so this is all relative to 1991. Yeah. This line at the bottom here is population growth. So in that entire 20 year period, uh, the population grew by 8%. Not 8% a year, 8% over the 20 years. This is the housing stock, so the number of actual units of housing in the, well, in the UK. And that grew by 16%. So if we're saying there's too many people and not enough houses, yet the number of houses has been growing faster than the number of people, this is not a satisfactory explanation for the whole housing bubble. And this blue line, does anybody want to guess what this blue line represents? It's, bank, it's mortgage lending. It's all the credit or money, however you want to define it, that has gone into the mortgage market. Now, which of these... Um, two options do you think is the most convincing explanation for the housing bubble? <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm not going to read this out because it's, it's very, um, it reads like an economics textbook and I don't want to send everybody to sleep this early in the morning. But basically this is the chairman of the FSA. Um, what he's saying in plain English is the system works like this. Banks start off by creating credit or money and putting it into a particular market, for example property. What that does is it means that the prices in that market start to rise. And then when prices start to rise, you see people saying, well, my house has gone up by this much. I'm feeling this much richer. Everybody thinks the property market is a good uh, market for your pension uh, to be invested in, rather than actually investing in a traditional pension. Uh, banks start to feel optimistic about where the market's going. You get uh, location, location, location on Channel 4. Um, telling everybody you can flip houses and get up to a million within 15 trades. Um, other people, uh, some of my friends, for example, 
said, well, no, if we don't buy a house now and house prices are going up at 10% a year, then in a couple of years we'll never be able to afford a place. So a lot of people think, well, now is the time to get onto the market before it's too late. Um, and all this leads to prices going up even faster. Now, because banks are lending more, they're earning more interest on all this lending to the property market. And what that's doing is that's feeding back into their profits and their profits then go into their capital. If they have more capital, that gives them more willingness and more ability to lend um, on a sort of simplistic level. And they're thinking, this is great. Let's start lending more. Let's start doing 90% mortgages, 100% mortgages, 110% mortgages. Uh, don't worry about whether they have an income. And that leads to more credit coming into the system, uh, even further house rises, house price rises and land price rises, even more optimism and even more profits and capital for the bank. And this is a, a pro-cyclical system that leads to house prices going, well, rising by 300% in the space of 10 years. Um, so this, this is not a supply and demand issue. It's an issue of banks being able to create money or credit and pump that into a fairly restricted market like housing. And of course, the whole time you have people saying, well, no, there's no bubble. Um, now, the real sort of human impact of this is if you look at what it actually costs to pay for a house, if you, if you see in the press sort of the affordability indexes and the house price index, they always talk about the price of the house relative to somebody's income. But you don't only pay for the price of the house, you also pay interest on that loan that you took to buy the house. And the interest actually adds up it's, it's always slightly more than the actual amount you borrowed over 25 years. It could be one and a half to even two times the amount you borrowed. So I think it's more useful to look at how much you're paying back in total with the interest included. In 1952, which is when my grandparents bought a house, it would have on an average taken you five years and three months of income, 100% um, of your income for that period of time to go to pay off your mortgage with all the interest on top. Whereas now, it's going to take you about 11 years and eight months. And you know, this is one of the reasons why you now need two income earners to run a family, whereas back in the 50s, you only needed one. Um, and it, what, what this means for anybody under the age of 40 is you're going to be working approximately another 10 to 15 years to pay for the place where you live. And you know, that's time you spend in the office instead of spending with your kids or doing the things you really want to do. So the impact on debt. Now, if banks create 97% of all the money that we use, they're not giving that money out for free. Um, there's only really two ways of getting this money from the banks. The first is to borrow it through loans by us as the public going into debt to the banks. Um, the other way of doing it is to actually work for the banks. Um, but there's only a percentage of people that can actually do that. Um, so basically, we as the public have to borrow the entire money supply from the banking sector. And of course, we have to be repaying all those loans, because all that money was borrowed, and paying the interest on top. So we're effectively paying interest on the entire money supply. If there is 100 pounds in your bank account right now, then somebody else is paying, somebody else has 100 pounds of debt, which they're paying interest on. Okay. And somebody has to have that debt. And then the implication is that if banks don't lend, well, that there would be no money in the economy. We're dependent on bank lending to create the money supply. Um, so there's a couple of rules of money which, which most economists have, and David Cameron and most uh, politicians are fairly ignorant of. And it's quite simple. If you want more money in the economy, you have to have more debt under the current system. It's not a law of nature. You can redesign this system so it works differently. But with the current system, if we want more money, we have to have more debt. And if we want less debt in the economy, then we will have less money. When you repay your loan, the money that you use to repay that loan effectively disappears from the system. And so in terms of the situation we're in now and trying to get out of this debt crisis, uh, personal and household debt is higher than it's ever been in history. Um, what we need, actually, is to have less debt and to have more money in the system so that you have a stimulus. But that is, is practically impossible with the current system as it works at the moment. Um, and I think uh, Steve Keane, who's speaking this afternoon, will probably suggest some ideas to address that 
second issue there, um, how we get less debt and more money in the system. Um, but where we are right now, you've got cash, the screen line at the bottom. This is the same chart as Josh showed. Um, the, bank supply, the bank issued money supply here, just going completely out of control. And at the top, you have the total debt. And the debt now is actually mounting up to higher than the money supply because you have the interest amounting and building up on top of you know, the loans that people can't repay. So inequality, um, I'm just going to show this very briefly. This is um, a bit of a complex chart, but essentially that purple line that you see there shows whether people are paying more in interest than they're actually receiving from their savings. And what you'll see is that the bottom 90% of the population by their wealth and their income is paying more in interest to the banks than they're actually receiving on their savings and other investments. So what this is is a net distribution of income and wealth from the bottom 90% to that top 10%. Um, and you know, when, before we crunched these sort of figures, we assumed it would be from you know, the bottom half to the top half. It's not. It's 90%. Even people in the top 20% are still paying interest to people in the top 10% of wealth. Um, and that's because of the way this money system works, because it's all based on debt. So you have this constant redistribution upwards and inwards. So the impact on jobs and businesses, well, you have um, what economists call the real economy, the shops, factories, the real businesses, you know, the people that produce and create stuff um, instead of moving numbers around in computer systems. And the real economy needs money to be able to trade and to function. But all this money, again, has to be borrowed from the banking sector. So the real economy has to pay interest on the entire money, well, their proportion of the money supply to the banking sector. And then again, this gives you a constant redistribution from the real economy to the banking sector. If you're wondering why the banking sector is the wealthiest and most profitable industry um, in the world, this is partly why. It's not because they're creating massive value, it's because they're creating all the money that the rest of us need to use. Um, so this is effectively a tax on the money supply. It's like giving Tesco a license to print money and then saying that we have to borrow everything from Tesco. You also have a redistribution from the rest of the UK to the city. So obviously Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, the north of England need money um, for their local economies to function. And again, we've got to pay interest on all this money. A lot of that interest has been redistributed to the highest earners in the banks who tend to be centred in London. So you have this constant redistribution from the rest of the country back to the centre, back to the city of London. Okay, and then for the, the high street, there's a lot of people who say, I, mean, I spoke to one politician and said, don't you think it's an issue that banks are able to create money in this way? And he said, no, I think credit's a brilliant thing. It means that people can buy washing machines on uh, credit cards, whereas otherwise they'd have to save up for it. Um, and, and there's a lot of people who think, you know, this is good for the economy uh, to have easy credit because it stimulates the economy. What actually happens is everything that is spent on a credit card in the high street or on Oxford Street or in the town centre today is something that can't be spent next year because it has to be repaid. So what we had running up to, the, um, up to about 2007 is you had loads of people using credit cards to borrow money and spend. And... What happens after a while of that is they get the bill. And then they think, OK, I've, I've overspent a little bit. Um, I should probably hold back now and start trying to repay this. So you have this sort of debt hangover. But what's happening as this is happening um, is that all the businesses are saying, well, this is brilliant. We're doing better than we've ever done before. The economy's healthy. Um, most of these high street chains aren't really looking at the build-up in consumer debt. They just think, you know, this is good. So they invest in staff in expanding their businesses. Um, they take on debt so that they can expand quickly enough. And then when everybody gets their bills and they stop spending, these businesses have to lay off people and they just try to survive. Okay. Um, and then this is what you get, essentially, is a boom-bust uh, cycle where it's pumped up by credit. Everybody thinks the economy is doing amazingly, but you then turn, it turns out to be a, um, a house built on sand and the whole thing collapses when the debt gets too much. And then every time it collapses, people get laid off. It tends to be the temporary workers, um, the people on like insecure contracts who are laid off first, so this has a big impact on poverty. 
Okay, um, I'll run on a couple of minutes. Um, the, do you think it would be useful to have a stable money supply for business? Because with this current system, you're guaranteed to not have that. You're guaranteed to have banks creating too much money when they're feeling confident and then too little when they panic. And that is, that's what's causing this boom-bust cycle. It's not just herd psychology or some law of nature. It's fueled by bank credit and banks' creation of money. Okay, so that last point, higher taxes. Um, anybody, knows, anybody know what happens if you print your own £10 notes at home? <laughs> you see, back um, a couple of hundred years ago, banks actually used to do that. They printed £10 notes or £5 notes as a receipt for what you'd put into the bank. Um, when you'd taken your shiny metal coins down to the bank and deposited them, they give you this receipt on paper. And people used to use these receipts as money. They'd spend the paper receipts instead of uh, actually getting the metal coins out of the bank, taking them to the shop, spending them, and then the shop having to take them back to the bank. Um, but effectively what happened with this is that the nature of money had changed from the coins to the paper money. And banks were the only ones creating this paper money. And the government of the day, uh, conservative government, realized that you know, we've allowed this power to create money to shift to the banks. And they used it effectively to create too much money and to blow up the economy in the 1840s. So the uh, Conservative Prime Minister, believe it or not, said we're going to take this power to create money away from the banks. And they did this in 1844, and that's why it's now illegal for you to print your own money at home. Okay. Now, ever since that, it doesn't cost £10 to print a £10 note. It costs a few pence. And the profit on creating that paper money the difference between the cost of creating it and the actual face value is then handed over to the treasury. And it can be spent by the treasury, which means it's money that we don't have to pay in taxes. And this has been a significant amount of money. In the last 10 years, it's added up to about 20, um, sorry, I think it's about 18 billion pounds. Um, in 2009, that profit on creating paper money was enough to pay the salaries of 120,000 nurses. Um, it's a significant amount of money. But going back to this chart, which shows you the green line at the bottom is money created by the state. The blue line is money created by the banking sector. We've been getting the profit on this much here. Um, it's a, the, profit, the term for this profit is called seniorage. Um, and we've been getting that profit. And we've been missing out <laughs> on this bit here. So this is approximately £2.1 trillion pounds of taxes that people have had to pay which wouldn't have been necessary if banks had kept this ability to create electronic money as well. Um, so 2.1 trillion, to put that into some kind of perspective, it's enough to pay off the national debt twice over. Um, and you need to, there's a big debate about whether the national debt's good or bad, but the higher the national debt, the more interest that's been diverted from public, sorry, the more taxes that are being diverted from public spending to paying interest on that debt, the more money that's been diverted from taxes into the financial sector. Uh, it's enough to pay for three year-long tax holidays. It's enough to pay for the NHS for about 20 years. Or we could have high-speed rail everywhere. <laughs> okay, so the key point is that by creating money, banks are shaping the economy. What they want to do with that money is going to determine the shape of our economy, whether we have an economy that's based on businesses and jobs or whether it's based on everybody trying to get rich on property. And you can see that in what we actually have now. So, final thing. Um, we have a choice, really. We have a choice between potentially having money created either by the state or through some sort of democratic means for something socially useful, or we have it created by banks and we have more expensive housing, economic instability, and speculation. Um, and back to these rules, we need, what we need right now is less debt and more money. And you can't do that as long as we have all money created by banks as debt. So, there we go. Mark, could you just get Mary's presentation loaded up? We're going to take three questions again. Molly, Chris, and uh, Michael. Um, I've got a comment, really. Is that working? 
more than a question. It's about going back to your point about housing finance. I've got a PhD student looking at this, and he's looking at the period BT before Thatcher. And um, at that time, 98% of housing finance actually came through building societies. And there was basically a kind of informal process where, you know, government policymakers, the people who ran the building societies, and people at the Bank of England kind of decided what was an appropriate interest rate to keep house prices more or less steady. And, um, you know, uh, to, to me, this would be a, a key proposal for how we should organise housing finance in the future. But we do have to recognise it will be very politically unpopular because it did mean the rationing of housing. People had to queue to get hold of that money and they had to wait a long time to, to buy a house. But it did achieve stability. Yeah. Um, Chris Cook, these are comments again. Uh, in a credit card system, there are no deposits, point one. Um, the graph is a bit misleading. I'd much prefer you to actually see, in 1963, a third was cash and two-thirds was bank money. Um, but it, and you make it look in absolute terms. It just looks a bit misleading to have it in absolute terms rather than proportional terms. Third point, bank money is not destroyed. This is a fundamental point where I think your analysis is wrong. Um, the only thing that destroys bank money or public money is tax. And, and if you like, the evidence is that far more... Um, tax is actually paid, then there is public money available to pay it. That's the evidence of that point. Um, and finally, um, I disagree, and I'll be talking about this, this afternoon. Um, it's a myth that banks took receipts and that was the money. Banks issued IOUs and that was the money. And that's the way it's always been. And again, I'll be talking about that this afternoon. So th that's the commercial. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, we. We've had two presentations now giving the alternative theory of money creation. It would be quite nice if in this session we had at least one presentation on the mainstream theory because at the moment we can't work out why 99% of economists accept the mainstream view and virtually none of them accept the view that's been put across this morning. And it's, it's, I mean, I'm an academic, I teach in this university and the way we teach is still the Socratic method, you know, you put a point and then you put the alternative and opposing point of view. That's what we teach our students to do. And uh, I don't know any economists in this university or people who teach in a business school where we were last night who would accept the view you're putting across. Now, I'm sympathetic to the view. I've believed it for many, many years. But I'm a theologian, so nobody would believe me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would like to have some e economically convincing uh, discussion of why this alternative model is simply that. It's regarded, even Wikipedia calls it heterodox which in theological terms is heresy. It's not the mainstream view. And you, you really need to give us an account of the rationality behind the mainstream view before we can judge the logic of your account. Do you see what Th I'm saying? It, I just Thanks, okay, yeah. Thanks yeah. Michael. Cool. Uh, and also, uh, if Ben doesn't have time to address all of that in detail, maybe Richard and Anne could, I don't know, think about that in the next session. Cool. Um, so yeah, whether bank money is destroyed when loans are repaid, However you want to define it, when people repay loans, it reduces the money supply in the hands of the public. It reduces the quantity of bank deposits owned by the public. And that reduces the money supply that can be used by the public to, to spend, basically. Um, that's, that's just the way the system works. Receipts versus IOUs, we could argue about the semantics of it. The, the impact, I think, was more or less the same. Um, the thing about mainstream economists, I'm sure, yeah, you can present all the different views, but you have about 20 hours for a course, and we've got 25 minutes. So... Um, but I'll do it very, very quickly. The reason why most of the mainstream economists disagree with this is because they, they go from the textbooks, they go from the theory, and they go from what they were taught years ago. And what we've done, and what other economists, and Steve Keen, and uh, the people who've been working on this for years have done, is looked at how banks actually operate and how it works mechanically. So what is taught in universities is, it's, you know, Charles Goodhart has been saying since 1980, that what they're teaching in universities is inaccurate and completely out of date. And it hasn't worked like that for 40, 50 years, and yet they're still teaching it. And what we've done with, uh, and what Josh has done with where does money come from, is looked at how it actually works mechanically now from the real original source, which is the Bank of England, the people who really run this system, and say, how does it actually work? 